Um, the first thing you want to think about when you're buying a classic car of any ilk, uh, but you know it, it's relevant to stags, is what you want from the car. Are you buying it as an investment? Are you buying it to show it in a concourse show or on the show field? Are you buying it just to enjoy? If you're buying it just to enjoy, um, a lot of the things don't really matter. Um, I've modified my car, you can see the old green Capri in the background. I have modified that to within an inch of its life. People say to me, ooh, it'd have been worth a lot more if you'd left it standard. I don't care what it's worth, it's my car, I enjoy it. I have customers who have very, very original stags. Um, they would be more valuable if they decided to sell. I also have customers who want originality like the one I'm gonna show you in a moment because it, the, it, the car is an heirloom. Um, it's gone down through the family and he wants it perfect because that's how it was to a member of his family. Um, and I, you know, I also have customers who just wanna use the cars. They don't mind if it had the wrong engine in. They don't mind if it's not absolutely perfect and original. They enjoy driving it day in, day out. But you kinda need to decide what you want to do. Some things will matter more than others. Um, some things can be put back to standard, some can't, um, but at the end of the day, it's your car and you need to decide what you want from it, okay? And click. So first things first, uh, as the values obviously differ slightly, I'm gonna show you the differences between a Mark One and a Mark Two Stag. Back in the day, Mark One Stags, when the Mark Two came out, people wanted to convert their Mark Ones into Mark Twos. There are only very subtle differences to see. Um, so some Mark 1s have been in, turned into Mark 2s back in the day. Now, Mark 1s are a little bit more valuable than Mark 2s, so people turn Mark 2s back into Mark 1s. Um, I'll show you a few of the obvious things that I can show you in my workshop. Uh, the first one is, this is a Mark 2 in front of you. So you can see there the wheels that are similar to a, well, they're a five-spoke aluminium wheel, ATS Classic style, uh, not made by ATS, I hasten to add. Um, these are Mark II wheels. Now, obviously, it doesn't wheels are irrelevant. Some will have Y wheels, some will have uh, mini lights, things like that. But these are the correct wheel for a Mark II stag. This valve here comes out in the middle of this spoke. Okay, that means it's a genuine Triumph wheel. If the valve appears here in the middle of this opening. It's a copy, it's uh, an aftermarket wheel. Um, as I said earlier, you really need to decide what you want to do with your stag. If you're totally bothered about value and um, concourse and things like that, and you're gonna compete and show it, then obviously these are the th things you need to know. So the Mark I stag should, should, if it's original and historic, have a steel wheel, okay? These are a 5J, by 14 inch wheel, okay, so 14 inch diameter wheel, five inches wide. They should be fitted with an embellisher ring. Excuse that, I'm being totally filthy. I'm waiting for the tires to arrive for those for the yellow stag on the right. The embellisher rings there look like a five stud wheel. They resemble a Ross style wheel. Those are original Mark I stag embellishers, okay? Now then, I'm temporarily standing the stag Mark I on the five spokes from the Mark II. They're all knocked about. It's just because they hold air. Um, so if you have the correct wheel nuts, these have a steel wheel nut on. You can see those steel wheel nuts on there. Those are the original Mark I wheel nuts. The Mark II wheel nuts are more like this. They should be aluminium. Uh, some are steel, some are aluminium. These are aftermarket. These are stainless steel. I like these. These are lovely. They don't corrode or anything. You don't get the dissimilar metal corrosion, but that's, that's by the by. Okay, next. So the next thing on the Mark I and Mark II stag difference is, if you can see just down here, the grille badge on a Mark II is black backgrounded with a silver stag. The Mark I grille badge has a grey or silvery background with a silver stag. Okay, these are Mark I. Okay, the yellow car is a Mark I. The rear wing badges, this is the offside in the UK, so this is the driver's side, oh, it's a right-hand drive car. As you can see again, silver grey background with a silver stag. The stag should be pointing forward. That is the correct one for that side of the car. Now the white stag, <clears throat> it should have black badges on here. However, this car came with these. These are an American 
uh, side marker light, and these are very, very desirable and very valuable, okay? These are original ones, as you can see, these are Lucas. You can get reproductions, they're still quite expensive. I like these, they came with the car, they're a little bit different, and they're quite nice. The badges are still available. Uh, you can usually find second-hand ones, and you can put the inserts in, which is what I've done with the yellow stack. Okay, next notable thing. Now then, please ignore the dash trim. Um, it's had a, a veneer put on it that's the wrong colour. The dashboards themselves will be the same colour in the Mark 1 and the Mark 2 stag. The gauges, however, are different. These are Mark 2. As you can see, they're quite a, a square font, um, and the needles are different. They have a matte black in with a polished outer. Okay? You will find the gauges are different in everything, but these also have, Mark 2s also have a hazard warning light in the middle which the Mark 1 doesn't have, it has a different layout, okay? If we go over to the Mark 1, again this is a walnut inlay, so it, that's not standard at all, but the woodwork was beyond saving. So if we're looking right. here, this car's actually covered at the moment, so I'll just shine a torch in there. As you can see now, hopefully, there's no hazard warning switch in the middle of that cluster. The walnut inlay is aftermarket. Um, the clocks are completely different, the font is finer, the needles are a different shape and they have a silver centre with a black dot in the middle of it. Um, they're a completely different layout on the clocks. Now then, coming away from that, you will also notice on a Mark 1, the bonnet release is on the driver's side here, on the right hand side, okay? On a Mark 2 it's on the other side, and then coming across to the seat, the headrest is sort of built into the seat here, okay? That's completely different to a Mark II, and I'll zip you across. Other than that, the interior is very much the same, okay? But that is a real giveaway if the seats have been changed. Going back quickly to the Mark II, you can see that the bonnet release is over on the passenger side there just inside the blue rag, okay, and there is a headrest, a later type headrest, I don't know if they did this for the American market, the Mark 1's in America had like an extension on the top, it looks similar to these as to glands but it's different, this part of the Mark 2 seat, these have been recovered obviously, is completely different here, okay, so that's different also. Quickly zipping you back to the Mark 1, You'll also see, hopefully, if I get my torch out again, this one has a map light in the glove box. Only Mark 1's had that map light, Mark 2's did not. This one's a little bit difficult to show you, but if you look down there at the rear bumper or fender or whatever you want to call it, the bumper bar there, can you see the badge in the middle, okay? On a Mark 2, there are no lights in that and it's a quite a small badge mounting. Also, while we're here, the number plate lights on a Mark II are in the boot lid, here. You can see these. Okay. So Mark I has this on the rear bumper. Okay, it's a larger Triumph mounting. Okay, and it has the number plate lights in that. Some will have both, uh, but this one has that. Now then, all these things so far, very, very, very easy to either return back to standard, um, change if you prefer one or the other. People have changed them over the years just because they prefer the seats or prefer whichever. The last one I'm going to show you for now, okay, uh, is the, the one that's very difficult, and this is the real teller. If you're looking at a can, say, oh yeah, it's definitely a Mark 1. Right, so this one that's difficult to change on a car, and it does involve skilled work rather than just nuts and bolts work, which I'm not saying isn't skill, but you know what I mean, um, is the door striker there and the door lock. Now, those are Mark II, and you can see the difference, okay? Those are Mark II. If I take you back over to the Mark I, it has a completely different striker assembly. If you are looking at a Mark II and it has that on, the shell is a Mark I and starts as a Mark I, or it's been altered to be a Mark I, but altering that is very difficult, okay? 
and the dart mechanism is completely different. It's all metal and the striker is up at the top, look. Okay, so that's the real giveaway. Whatever else I've shown you, bumpers, seats, dashboard, all that is easily changed. Okay, you can swap that over. Things you can't see so easily are things like the air intake on the carburetors should have two trumpets on it on a Mark 1. Um, the water hoses are slightly different. Okay, so they, there is a filler on the radiator rather than on the... On the uh, <laughs> there's a filler cap, a pressure cap on the radiator on a Mark 1 rather than the brass filler, which I'll show you in a sec. <laughs> But again, these are easy bolting swaps and can be changed. The yellow car I've, I've upgraded. The header tank there is off to market, obviously. This is how Mark II should look. That would usually be brass, okay? Uh, that one's just been painted black. It's, it's a brass fitting on a Mark I. That will have a pressure cap here. And in here, you see where I've, I've modified this for the owner to fit a header tank. But in here would be a bleed screw to allow you to bleed the air out on a Mark 1. Now, I'm not going to show you the Mark 2 because I've put a Mark 2 rad in, uh, Mark 1, sorry, because I've put a Mark 2 rad in that. Um, and that's just because it was a wide car rad and it's better for the engine and it, I had it in stock. So I've used that in there, obviously, with the consent of the customer. Okie dokie. So hopefully you can see me again now. Um, that was a quick skim over uh, the bulk of the obvious differences in a Mark 1 and a Mark 2 stack. It does go a little deeper than that, but as I say, the only thing that's really difficult and requires extensive welding to change are the door locks, okay? So if your Mark I has the Mark II door locks, it's a Mark II shell. Um, obviously, things like uh, the VIN, the plate, the, um, the numbers, the build numbers, they're very easy to change anyway. They're only pop riveted on, so, you know. Um, again, if it's a lovely car and you just wanted to use it, don't worry about it, it's your choice, you know, at the end of the day, you pay your money, you take your choice. Right, so, look at the Mark II behind me. Um, what I'm going to show you, hopefully, is going into the bodywork, okay? This part here, can you see that seam there in the B panel? Hopefully you have them, uh, I'm zooming you at it as we speak. Um, if this is absent here, usually it's had sill work done and somebody's done it wrong. Okay, if this comes flush down here, that's wrong. There should be this step that follows all the way down the door gap as we look, okay? Um, chances are that's chock full of filler. Now, I know for a fact these are steel because I put them there. Um, it's fixable, but bodywork is always expensive, unfortunately. Um, front wings available stags everything is just about available okay used or second hand obviously i'm not recommending you second hand panels at all but it is all there um but the actual having them fitted professionally to a good standard is not cheap you can have a go at doing it yourself um but it needs to be done right things you also need to check looking at this side of the car door gaps okay if someone has cut the sills or the inner sills out and not supported the car properly um it will fold up like a, a tea bag, basically. The car is not a strong shell at the best of times. If you cut all the rust out in one go, it will just fold up like a piece of origami. Um, so you need to be looking at door gaps there. You need to be looking at wing gaps, how the bonnet fits into this aperture here. Okay, it wants to be square. These seams here need to be filled. Okay, so these seams here, these should be filled like that. I weld these up solid and then grind that groove back in, okay, to try and stop this moving. They do have a, a tendency to crack here slightly, even when they're welded up solid, because obviously you have to put a smear of filler and stuff on there, and it will often move, okay, but that's how that should be. Um, when I say the bonnet should be square, it should be nice parallel gaps, a nice even gaps front to rear. The front gap is always a little bit bigger to allow the bonnet to hinge open, okay, um, if you're ever looking for stag parts and somebody says, oh, I've got a rust-free bonnet, I'm going to tell you now, I've never seen a rotten bonnet on a stag, ever. Um, wings, uh, I think they're, well, last time I bought one, they're about £800 each, plus fitting. Um, if you're having sills done, you can get a lower section and weld it in here. Um, doors, difficult to get hold of, very difficult, very difficult door to reskin. These have been done by a, quote, professional before I saw the car, and they aren't correct, unfortunately. Other gaps to check, uh, this gap here, 
this gap here, okay? Those need to be nice and consistent. They shouldn't be so big you can get in the car without opening the door. Uh, mirrors. Uh, mirrors on a stag are a complete disaster. Um, wherever you sit, you can never see in the mirror. So don't think somebody's fitted them wrong. They were like that from the factory. Um, now then, going a little more into the bodywork, front and rear wheel arches. Now, we all know wheel arches rot away on cars, especially on classic cars from the 70s and 80s, well, 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, triumphs are no worse than anything else. People say, ooh, you know, British cars, ooh. Well, a load of rubbish. They all rotted. There were, there were terrible moisture traps and things like that in them. If you can find me a mat to escort that and been re-welded in every inch, then, you know, you're doing really well. Either way, they're all going to be rotten. So this gap here, okay, there should be a nice even panel inside. These have had inner arches in, okay, and it should be a nice level at the back there. Be very careful if you're checking it that you don't cut yourself. You don't want big wadges of filler in there. You don't want blooming big holes either. Um, the sills should be capped off neatly, all right? These have been done, as you can see I've done them, they've been ground back and you can't tell, all right? It's all been neatly done. It's had repair work done, but it's all been neat and accurately done. This um, arch flange should be about three quarters of an inch like that. That is correct, okay, all the way around. The same at the front. The front has an inner arch. It's a very complicated inner wing at the front here. This has had inner arches, inner outer arches, everything. These should be spot welded around here. There shouldn't be a knobbly weld around here. These should have been spot welded. Now I drill these or stamp them, usually drill them actually, and plug weld them in. But that should be a nice gap. It's, if there's any big lumps, bumps, sealer, things like that, it's usually covering something. Yes, it can all be fixed. Yes, it has a price. You can also see on this car, this one has stainless steel sill covers. I'm not a fan of these, but Mark II has had them fitted. Okay, Mark ones did not, um, but people quite often fit them as a vanity thing. Um, they're also quite often fitted to cover up a rusty or badly fitted sill. Again, be aware of that. Let's try and draw you a very quick picture of how the floor should meet the inner sill and vice versa, okay? So if you were looking down the length of the sill in cross section, and that's the outer sill there like that, the bottom seam comes down and wraps under like this, okay? That's that piece I was pointing to that said the step should be in it, and that's the side of the car, okay? Um, the inner sill comes up here. It's really, really thick material. It's heavy artillery, and it comes like that, and then it goes off. It actually, there's a little radius there. You won't see any of that if it's been done correctly, and there is a little channel down it that the wiring runs down, and then it goes off, and there are seams up here. We're not going to worry about the floor comes across to it like this, okay? And it is spot welded here upwards. Anything else is wrong, okay? That's the correct way of doing it. You have to weld it up upside down. It isn't easy, but it is right when it's pretty like that. So you spot weld them, plug weld them, and then grind them back. It's very thin smear of sealer if it needs it. And then whatever underbody treatment you are gonna put on there. As an example of that, as you can see here, there's a bit of God only knows what been welded in there. It's a disaster. They've tried to plug weld it and spot weld it. I'll give them the dues. Uh, other than that, it's a disaster. You can see a big lip here, okay, a big gap there. That would just allow the ingress of mud and dirt and salt. As you can see, it's, gone, it's got a salt reaction on it already. Now, this car's a good example um, because you can see the original inner sill the uh, inner sill here, outer sill underneath it with that return that I just showed you, and then somebody has welded another sill clean over the top of all that, which means there's a load of rot behind there that needs to come out. You can also see the floor, the original floor. Okay, you can see the seam there down the edge of it where it goes up flat. I hope you can see that. That's quite important. Now, if the car is strong, again, it depends what you're paying, depends what you want it for. Uh, quick word on floors, aftermarket floors, panels that you can buy, they fit appallingly. The front sections are good, the bad sections are just all the wrong shape. When I do these, I will only trim out the rust wherever it is. So on this one, for example, sorry, pointing with my torch that I'm trying to use as a light. Uh, this one here, okay, I will just cut down the edge of that rust. I'll clean it back with a wire wheel and I'll cut down the edge there. I'm pointing to there. 
okay and I will put a new section in there all the way down I'll check any other rust and rot and I will form pieces in to make it look good if it's rotten right down to here I'll take all that out and I'll change that uh, and replace it you also need to add check your outriggers these are standard outriggers you can see the seam all the way down the middle the ones you have to buy to replace them with don't have that now if you are wanting super duper originality I could fabricate those for you quite easily although they are made out of very thick steel um, most people are just happy to put aftermarket ones in which come as a solid section if it's had those put in it, it won't detract from the value I can show you that but if you're gonna go and try and win concourse competitions and you're paying 50 grand for a car you don't want that you want them to be remade like the originals like that okay this they taper off slightly at the front here okay the aftermarket front cross uh, outriggers are much much better you can also see while I'm hungry you can see the lip where the front floor joins the bulkhead there that's correct I always refit that in there um, in the interest of originality this here the chassis rail should be solid and made out of really really heavy duty gear this is important in a stag there's a lot of strength there as are the inner sills and the sills so that's the bulk of the bodywork really on Mark 1 and 2 stags are pretty much the same. Um, now I tried to sell a very early Mark 1 Capri a while ago and it needed probably £25,000 of the welding done. Excuse me and I must have had 50 questions when I sold it saying what's the engine like does it run and I said I've no idea I've never tried it it's had a 1.3 cross flow in it uh, to rebuild one of those probably if it needs absolutely everything done you're probably looking at thousand pounds worth of parts maybe a machining maybe a little more maybe two grand when it needed 30 grand worth of welding um, I, I wouldn't have concerned myself and never did concern myself with the engine stags are different okay uh, we've heard the scare stories about stag engines um, they are completely different okay the engine is exceptionally expensive to rebuild um, so if it's been done and there's an invoice to show it's been done and it's been done properly that is a very 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 good thing um, uh, this one I know for a fact has been rebuilt the customer had it rebuilt before it came to me for uh, restoration um, I installed a stag web of conversion on it. I've removed the original Zenith Strombergs, okay? People will argue that they are the best carburetor in the world. They were fine back in the day. This is still an old-fashioned carburetor. However, it's a revolution on a stag. If it is a car you want to show, you will have to do your best with the Zenith Strombergs. They are pretty much worn out by now, and the modern fuels that we get in the UK, especially with the E10 and stuff in it, plays literally havoc on them. And if the carburetors cause you problems the chances are it's going to ruin the engine it will fill the manifold with fuel if they overfuel um, the needle valves quite often stick on them and you'll see fuel pouring out the overflows if it's done that by the time it's done that the chances are the intake manifold is full if you do 100 miles on that you're going to need an engine rebuild and it's going to be a full rebuild which could cost you anywhere between depending on who was doing it circa 8 to 10k probably i would suggest it depends what needs doing if you can get away with not damaging the crank uh, not needing new pistons just rings and a, a hone and things like that it could be less but one way or another is if it is a full engine rebuild it is not going to be cheap okay parts are unobtainable for stags in certain areas things like crankshafts uh, left hand uh, camshafts things like that are very very difficult to get hold of superfluous items like you know valve springs uh, valves things like that you can get head castings are very hard to get in good condition most of them have been skimmed to death because back in the day, people didn't use the correct coolants in them, okay? Anyway, back to the Weber. Um, upshot of it is, it makes them more drivable. They go a little bit better, they're better on fuel, they start better, they don't overfuel, and believe it or not, they sound better. Now, I know that makes me sound like I'm a Stag Weber dealer. I am not, but I can't advocate the quality of that conversion anymore. It's fantastic. It costs a little bit. Uh, but it makes the stag a really usable thing now then, we can't do anything on a stag engine without talking about cooling uh, people worry about cooling and they did give problems back in the day which hence why every head's been skimmed to death um, my dad had a garage when I was a kid so 50 years ago and he said people just didn't change oil they didn't change 
you know, they didn't plan to freeze anything. They just put water in because it was costs and, you know, it was an everyday car. They ran it into the ground and then they got rid of it. If it's had a, an engine rebuild, you've taught the heads down correctly and you put good blue glycol only antifreeze. Don't use the pink stuff, don't use the green stuff. Use the blue glycol mixed at the correct ratio and you keep it topped up and you check the oil and change it regularly. It will be fine. There is no two ways about it. It will drive fine, it will drive cool. This engine has a header tank on it. That will reduce the coolant temperatures significantly. However, if, you, if your viscous is okay and your engine's okay, you don't need that. If it's starting to overheat, chances are you can add a, cool, a header tank and it'll probably cool it down a bit, but the chances are something else is wrong. Okay, so your carbs are out, your timing's out. If you haven't touched any of those things, your engine's probably just worn out, and I'm sorry to say it, but it's true. Um, it, it isn't a, a stag thing per se, okay? They do have problems with the head gaskets. They do have some design flaws in there. But if you look after it, you know, you're not going to be going out and doing the Nürburgring in it. If you keep it maintained, for the mileage this engine's going to do, it'll be fine. You're looking also to buy a car, you want to look at one that's been used reasonably regularly, okay? The engine's been run up. If you leave them to stand, the head gaskets blow. And I know that sounds really weird and probably an engineering impossibility, but it's true, they do. This one's had a header tank as a, as a, as a safety net, if you like, really. Uh, I've fitted one with an external water pump and stuff like that. I've fitted two or three, actually. They work incredibly well at running them cool. If you combine the two, it'll never get up to temperature. It'll never open the thermostat. Uh, I know a few little tricks with the cooling system. Oh, uh, if people upgraded to a 12-vein pump, if they haven't put the housing in correctly, that's a bad thing. It won't work right. And 12-vein pumps are no better than 6-vein. In fact, they may be slightly worse. Sorry, but it's true. Everything in there mechanically is good. It just wants to be serviced. Uh, most of our electronic ignition conversions, again, good thing. Use illumination, use something good quality. Um, certain brands that are very cheap are cheap for a reason because they're utter rubbish. The power steering works well. Um, change the plugs every year, you know, change the oil, change the filters. This car has a spin on filter conversion rather than a cartridge filter. Doesn't make any difference, but that's what it had. Uh, works very well indeed. Another point to note now is uh, tyres. Tyres for stags, Mark 1 or Mark 2, are incredibly difficult to get hold of. You can't really go and get the correct size, which should be, I know for the steels it's a uh, 18514, okay? You can't go to your local tyre person now and say, just order me a set. If you do, you'll probably get van tyres or commercial tyres, which A, look terrible and B, run terrible. I have just ordered some for that car uh, from a place in Bartree that does classic car tyres. Google it up if you want. They're not paying me to put their name in here. They are quite expensive, but they are also authentic. And to be honest, for the amount of use that car's probably going to get, they'll probably easily pay for themselves, if that makes sense. Okay? Um, but you're not going to walk into your local tyre shop, your quick fit and all the like, and it's nothing against them, but you just people aren't making tyres this size. A 15-inch tyre is not a common size anymore. Everything's 17, 18, 19s. Um, so they are quite difficult to get. I would recommend getting those authentic. I'm getting Michelins for that. Um, and yeah, they're quite expensive, but to be honest, if I was buying tyres for my Audi, they'd be more expensive. So, you know, it's horses for courses. They'll last the same amount of time, probably more. They'll probably go out of date before they wear out. Going back into the Mark II here, uh, interior, very expensive, very, very expensive to replace. Um, these came from Aldridge's, I believe. Yes, they did. Definitely I bought those. Um, excellent, excellent quality. Uh, same as the seat coverings, excellent quality. The foams have all been done. This is lovely. It's a little bit, it's got some dirt in it at the moment because it's having the hood change. Um, the hood, again, big expense. The frame needs to fit correctly. Um, again, it can be done. I, I, as I'm doing this one, I've just fitted one to the yellow stag. Um, but it's not a cheap thing to do. The parts alone are very expensive. The frames, unless they are totally beyond use, are usually adjustable to the nth degree. It's one of their complications. They're very complicated. They're a nightmare to get up and down, uh, but they um, they will adjust usually to back to shape. This one I've it's over there actually. You can see it over there next to my bucket seat. Um, it, I've just had it sandblasted, and I'm about to paint that probably today actually. Uh, it should all go in here. When you put it down, the window should be unzipped. The Mark II has no side windows here. Pretend I'm tapping on them. 
Some of the later Mark, the Mark ones had a, a small triangular window here, looks truly ridiculous. Um, some of the later Mark ones, like the yellow one behind me, they had the Mark II hood fitted. So there is a Mark one and a half where there was a bit of a transition where things started to change. So you do need to be aware of that too. Uh, hoods, expensive, made out of mohair, but they are nice. When they are right, they're nice. If there's any damage to it, and it's like, oh, well, it's only got a little hole in it. Well, yeah, well, it's going to be a couple of grand to change it. So think about that. Uh, interior, same thing. It's all changeable. I, I actually, personally, I'm only five foot eight, but I prefer the seats when they've got a little bit of wear in them because otherwise I feel like I'm a little bit too high. Uh, you can get the new bladders from underneath. You can get the covers, the foams, all that. But again, adds to the value. If it's, if it's in good condition, it's worth it, all right? Uh, trim and bumpers. Bumpers are available new. Um, getting them in good condition second hand seems nigh on impossible. Uh, been trying to do that. The rear bumper, uh, the rear bumper there is available in sections. So for example, this one, I'm gonna put a new uh, outer section on the other side. I think they're about 200 pounds each. They were last time I bought one, don't know what they'll be now. Other trim is all available. These are harder to get. These here, you can only get second hand and they are nigh on impossible to get. If you can get some of those in good condition for sensible money, buy them. Um, petrol filler caps are hard to get. This should lock and it should be the matching key. Obviously you can buy a lock set, so it's not the end of the world if it isn't. Um, these trims here, they're readily available second hand usually. They've usually got a few little pot marks because they are aluminium. But they're okay. These are all available new. These are all available new under here. Uh, bumpers are now available in stainless steel. If I address you over to the Mark 1, that is a stainless steel bumper bar I fitted to this. Okay. Now, I fitted stainless steel bumpers to all sorts of classic Triumphs, and I wasn't very impressed with some of the others. These ones, I have to say, are very, very nice. Uh, made by the same people, but the bolt fittings, the threads and all that seemed a lot better. They come with the overriders, with the rubbers, with the trims, and I'm quite impressed with that. Um, I've just added some glue to the badge, hence why there's some tape on there, but yeah, I'm pleased with that. I'm just waiting for some uh, rear uh, bumper brackets to come, and that's the rest of the bumper there. They come from Thailand, they take a few weeks, but they are significantly cheaper than the steel ones. The steel ones, I think to buy new now, are, are well over £1,000 each plus bars, plus overriders, plus rubbers for the overriders, etc., etc. So, you know, you're looking at a lot of money just in parts. They're not a difficult thing to change, um, but it, it's reasonably time-consuming, but it's not difficult. Uh, the only reason being there's some bolts hidden in the boot that you have to strip out the boot out. Okie doke. Going back to the Mark II again, transmissions. This one is a manual overdrive. I don't think I've ever seen a manual stag without an overdrive, although I do believe some have been fitted. Um, obviously, it has a clutch pedal. Same on Mark 1 and Mark 2. And this is the uh, hydraulic tank, the little bottle for the clutch master cylinder. This cutout will be there, even if it's an automatic. So the yellow one has this. Um, all the shells had that, so it's not, if it's there, it doesn't mean it's been converted from one to the other. Um, the Mark 1 and Mark 2 stags had different overdrives. Um, now, you, don't quote me on this, I could be wrong, but I think the Mark 1 had the A type and the Mark 2 had the J type, but I could be way off. I can check that. Um, it'll be in the, the um, Haynes manual, no doubt, but I can have a look at that. Um, I'll also draw your attention to seat belts. If you're looking at seat belts, these have been upgraded. These are from any part supply, basically. I get these from my local um, car accessory shop, um, and they fit here. They don't actually fit snugly like the originals into there. They fit on a stock. However, they are significantly safer than attempting to use the originals. Um, they're usually frayed. The clasps don't always work, and those are better still. Um, so that's, in my opinion, a necessary upgrade rather than an originality thing. Uh, this car, the yellow Mark 1, is an automatic. You probably can't see very easily. That one uses a Bargwana 35. Um, right up until the Mark 2, they used a Bargwana 35, three-speed auto. Late, late cars used a Bargwana 65. Slightly better gearbox, not a lot in it really. The, the Bob 135 was in Rovers, it was in everything. 
Great little gearbox. It's a bit clunky. It will leak oil. If it leaks oil all over your garage floor, drip, 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 drip. Don't be surprised. Uh, you can spend about £20,000 to try to get somebody to stop those leaks. Ain't never going to happen. It will continue to leak. That's what they do, unfortunately. I've spent hours and hours and hours at Yorkshire trying try to stop a, an auto box leaking. And it comes to a point where you've done everything you can physically do. And they are still going to weep a tiny bit of oil. Um, you just kind of have to put an old carpet tile under it and throw it away. Um, this will be the same. It'll weep oil a bit. It is actually leaking a little bit from one of the fittings I've put in there. I need to change that. Uh, or address it at least. Um, there is a conversion, again, going back to reusability. I have a customer who has had the Jaguar um, ZF gearbox, four speed automatic transmission fitted, beautiful gearbox. The car is smooth as silk, and if it's a car you want to drive, he does drive his a heck of a lot, um, then I would heartily recommend that. If you combine a Stag Weber with a good Stag engine with a um, ZF gearbox, you are onto a real winner uh, if it's a usable car. If you're looking at originality and value, not so much, but he doesn't care. We've lowered it, we've put slightly uprated shocks on, and I've got to say the car drives perfect. The engine is very worn on his car, however, it, it drives like a new car, it's beautiful, it, it corners well, it handles well. Uh, I mean, it again, it, it's, it's not a GTR. But for a stag, it's it's the best stag I've driven. Um, and it's an automatic gearbox that's smooth as silk. It's up into fourth at 30 mile an hour. It's brilliant. I can't heartily recommend it enough. I don't do the conversion myself. He took it to a garage uh, somewhere who does it. I can't remember who it is. Um, expensive job. Now, as I say, that would detract from the overall value of the car as an investment. But for a driver car, if you're choosing to use it, you want to go out in it, spend some time, go on holiday in it, things like that. Absolutely worth its weight in gold, in my opinion. Right. Last thing now. Uh, mechanically, um, everything's available. Service parts are cheap. Brakes are available. Cylinders. Um, I usually put stainless overbraided hoses in. You don't have to. Um, master cylinders are reasonably expensive. But everything else is available at sensible prices from most um, stag parts dealers or most places. Um, Front shoes, calipers, re uh, sorry, front pads, calipers, discs, bearings, all that is readily available at sensible prices. Springs, shocks, again, not expensive. These shocks become, come as an insert for the front struts. Um, not the easiest thing to change. They can be a bit of a problem now and again because they have a fancy nut in the top, but not too bad. Uh, you will usually find they should have a gator on there. I don't know if you can see it behind the spring. Okay. They rot away quite badly and you do have to strip the entire shock down to change them. Um, you need a proper spring compressor for that. They aren't an easy spring to compress. I have a hydraulic one that works beautifully. Um, it's not an MOT failure, um, but it does look a mess when they're all perished and they're falling to pieces. Uh, diffs. Diffs are available. They're about £1,000. I'm probably going to change this one. I just want to confirm it's definitely the diff that's making a noise in this car. Um, there was always a little noise and I can't remember if it was the gearbox or the diff so when the roof is back on they'll take it out for a drive just confirm if it is the diff um, I think they're about somewhere around just shy of a thousand pound once you've got your, your money back on your, on your deposit um, on your existing diff you have to send one off to get one back um, also there's two ratios the automatic has a 345 which is a little bit higher um, the other one is a I think it's a 375 could be wrong um, Again, I'm going to check this one because he wants a slightly higher ratio if it's available, just to just to lower the cruising RPM at about 60, 60 mile an hour or 70 on the motorway. He does push it along a little bit. Um, he doesn't drive it like he stole it, but he does uh, he does drive it like a normal car. So, so there's that. Uh, back to engines. You will occasionally see one with an engine that's been swapped. Now, there's many reasons for this. Um, it's frowned upon. I know if you go on the stag pages on Facebook and you say, well, I think I'm going to whop a 350 Chevy in there, they'll probably take you out at dawn and stone you. Um, I, it comes down to usability, really. If your Triumph V8 is ruined um, and it is going to need a full £10,000 rebuild, then the other alternative straight away is this, which is a Rover V8. And people go, ooh, why would you fit one of them? <laughs> I've driven both. And if you ignore value for a moment, a, a Rover V8 and a Stag is fantastic. It really is. It has a little more power, does a little more torque. 
Um, it doesn't sound as nice. The stag engine sounds significantly better, I'll give you that. Uh, but it does make a very, very, very nice drivable car. It's not an easy fit. You'd have to do something um, with the, uh, sorry, with the mountings and the front cross member and you have to faff about with a different carb and stuff. But once you've done all that, um, obviously with a, you need a, um, a five-speed manual SD1, five-speed manual or an auto box, Bog 1 or 35 again, but a different bell housing. Um, it, it, it really is a revelation. If you're worried about value, don't consider it. If you have bought one with that in and you just want to drive it, drive the heck out of it. Rover V8's gone forever. They do about 100,000 miles. And when they're worn out, they usually only need a camshaft. Um, I have run Rover V8s in cars for years. That is mine for my, I bought it for my car. They are going up a little bit on, on price. However, you can find them for sensible money still. Um, I can't remember what I paid. I think I paid 300 quid for that. So they are out there. It does need a rebuild, but the last Rover V8 I rebuilt, I did all performance parts on it, uh, high lift camshaft, roads lifters, all that sort of stuff, new big ends, new mains, new pistons, and the whole parts list came to 600 quid. So, you know, compared to the beautiful Triumph V8, it is a significantly cheaper engine to, to have maintained once it's in there, or if it is already in there. Now, if you're bothered about value and you're bothered about people going tutting and sign at shows, don't consider it, but it does make a nice little conversion. An SD1 engine is particularly good. Um, you still have cooling issues with the Rover V8. They don't run cool either, so, you know, don't, don't start thinking you, you're getting away with that. You also get them with a, a straight six, try and straight six in. People did that back in the day a lot when these engines were not fastidiously maintained and worn out. Again, if you want to drive it, great engine. Beautiful little engine. Smooth and nice. It won't make the right noise, but it will be drivable. Value-wise, um, a Rover V8 or a straight six will kill the value stone dead. And the more the car is worth, um, the more undesirable that is. Okay, so while ever these are going up in value and desirability, then obviously the wrong engine is detracting from that and people hate it. But that does come back to what I was saying before. Like my Capri, you know, I, I paid. I'll tell you what, put in the comments what you think I paid and I'll tell you. Okay, for that Mark 1 shell that just needed paint and the engine fitted in it. Um, I bought it 10 years ago, 15 years ago, something like that. And I'll tell you how much I paid for it. Um, if you're buying a car to use because you just want some enjoyment from it, uh, stop worrying about the value and just enjoy it. If you're having one restored, you can't worry about the value because you'll always come out behind. Um, you've got to want the car to be fixed and to be right. You will never come out uh, making money. Uh, if you can do it yourself and it comes with all the parts, then potentially you might make some money. I had a Mark II Escort. I bought it for peanuts before they went rocketing up in value. Um, I built it in my garage before I did this for a living, and I sold it on, and I made some money. Um, if I charged the labour, I would have lost about £25,000. Um, and the only reason I made some money was they shot up in value overnight from when I bought it to when I sold it. They the raced up in value, which was just... Good fortune. Uh, there was no, there's no skill. There was no knowing about it. It just happened to be lucky that way. Anyway, I'm wishing on again. I'll shut up. But I hope you've enjoyed that. I hope that helps you and gives you some idea of what you are looking at when you go to buy one of these. Everything's fixable, but you know, think about the value. Think about what what it's going to cost to fix. Uh, Bodywork is expensive. Um, paint is expensive and getting more expensive, unfortunately. But that's how it is, you know. If somebody says, oh, I can paint that for a £1,000, well, I painted my Capri over there. The paint cost me about 500 quid, uh, and I painted that myself. So if somebody's doing you a paint job for a £1,000, <laughs> well, you pay your money, you take your choice. Um, you get what you pay for with paint. Uh, so consider that also. Obviously, colour changes are a big deal on a stag. Um, you'll see all sorts of colours. I, I particularly favour white on them. Um, but I also particularly favour the purple, uh, which name I can't remember all of a sudden, weirdly. Um, but I love that that sort of 60s purple colour. I don't think any colour is worth more. But look at the general condition. If it looks right, it is right. Oh, one last point. Don't be blinded by the bling. Don't be blinded by alloy wheels. Don't be blinded by wire wheels, chrome sill covers, a flashy steering wheel, um, a walnut dash. Look beyond that. It's a little bit like like a house you know if it looks really blingy when you turn up and then when you buy it the furniture isn't there remember 
same sort of thing. Look beyond that. Look at the, the, the quality and solidity of the body work and consider what it, if it needs anything. And don't, I mean, if the seller's saying, well, it'll only cost you 50 quid to have that fixed. Well, it'll only cost you 100 quid to fix that. You know, think about it. Always weigh up what you're going to do. There's always another one will come along. Yes, I've missed a bargain and wished I'd bought it. We all do. But there will be another one along. These aren't, they aren't the last three in the world. There will always be another care. If you want a restoration project like the green one over there, remember it's going to cost you money to fix it. And it's going to be quite a lot. But then when you're finished, at least like this white car that I restored, you know it's a good, solid, correctly built car. If you're having it restored, weigh up your restorer. Have a look at their work. Come to their workshop. Look at a car like this GT6 I've got behind me. Look at the welding on it. Look at the finish. Look at the panel gaps. You know, have a look at what they have done. Not a finished sprayed up car that could be chock full of filler. Okay. Um, so yeah, hope that helps. Um, keep driving them. That's what they're meant for. And it does them a lot of good. Thanks for listening. Cheers. Bye-bye. Oh, any questions, please feel free to ask.